Like how, how does the mechanism of improving the customer experience and turning the organization human-centric actually sit within different levels of the organization and how do you build processes um, around that? So I think it's in most cases when you're talking to senior executives, I'm sure you both have um, perspectives on this as well, is when you're talking to them, it's mostly not about that they would be opposed to the idea of turning the organization human-centric, because it's actually really hard to disagree with that, uh, but it's more like um, they don't necessarily see the connection of um, systematic development of CEX and the business that they're in. So you kind of have to wrap their heads around um, what the connection of the CEX and the things you do for CEX is to the business. So I think that's one of the bigger things I spent my time on at Posti. So I think our design team per se is actually really well aligned um, on, on the common goal. So it's more about convincing the others that it's, it's a good idea to drive systematic CX evolution. What about Camilla? Yes. Well, my, my mission has been to, to add this uh, emotion level, which is really good in, uh, in CX um, field too. But when I see that what has happened during the seven years that I have worked with emotions every day and see the attitude change in top management towards emotions and these more human skills, you could say, is that also I recommend everybody to, to really find different aspects and bring them to the table. So for example, for emotions, there is so strong evidence that how it is needed, for example, in the era of artificial intelligence. And artificial intelligence is really cool thing for top management. So really trying to find these Tro Trojan horses in a way that where you can bring that if you want this, you have to have this. So reasoning in a way. Mm -hmm. So I think, and, and read the newspapers and find the different things that, that it's not just this, but these are the benefits. Mm. And Hayley, you mentioned turning, finding those champions and finding those detractors. How did you turn one into the other, hopefully for the better? Yeah, I guess I, I mean from a, um, a perspective, you know, that is more, I guess you would describe as bottom up, not as much leadership, but the people working um, on product teams. Uh, I, I remember very specifically um, there being people who, um, for example, they would they would try to put um, like a data visualization color palette into the design language. And in the past, they used to have to go to one specific person and kind of ask for a request to have something put in. And that person actually controlled, you know, the code base and uh, like, how things were um, represented in the system. And so, uh, you know, they might see something put in one day and then maybe a couple weeks later it disappears and that can cause a lot of confusion. <laughs> well, what happened to it or why did someone take it out without explanation, right? And so a big change for us was building those new um, operating models like the contribution model where the there was no one single owner of something, mm -hmm. but instead everyone had access and could make a pull request and get the reviews done um, so that their component was a part of the system that mm -hmm. could live on. Yes. And Juho, you mentioned radical feedback as one of the topics. So I would like to then invite Haley and Camilla to talk about the things that resonated most in the talk you gave? Um, actually, I tweeted it um, already that I loved when you, what you say that you understood that design is a mindset, not a tools, and that is completely the same thing with emotions. It's not tools or what quick fixes I can do, like I, like I, I told before, but it's more about what is my attitude? How do I see people? Do I, benefit, I give a benefit of a doubt? Do I see that, okay, I'm sure that there's a positive thing because then you're more open, you're more eager to ask questions and all these things. So I really love the mindset thing. Mm -hmm. um, something that really resonated with me um, in particular was the gaming environment that you worked on where you mentioned that you were, I mean, in some ways, like truly going, <laughs> truly going native in your users' worlds and you were completely embedded with them and that that facilitated this new kind of conversation and way of maybe like prototyping and iterating um, in real time. And I, f I feel like whether that's in the virtual space, which is really great to show as an example, um, but also like in, in person um, too often, uh, we miss those opportunities to just 
sit down next to the, the people that are you know, right there in front of us um, and really not just ask them questions, but also observe them. Like, what are they doing? I love that you're looking at the behaviors and then how do they feel? So I felt like that was just something that, um, that I took away as, as really important. Actually, I actually have a quick remark on that. Mm -hmm. I think people mistake co-creation as something that happens on a planned schedule as a workshop. So we should really consider co-creation as something that can happen at any, any point in time when you're interacting with someone, be that your customer or your, or your co-worker or, or whatever. Because every single, um, every single moment in your touch point is actually um, another opportunity to do co-creation. So one of, somebody from the audience, Nina, she asked how much of this collaboration and learning is really taking place? So how would you measure or evaluate that, if it's even possible? Value of... Um, evaluate. Like evaluate the... How much is really taking place? Right. Um, in terms of like collaboration, co-creation or... Mm. I think... Um, you can look at that from two different angles. Like you can look at evidence um, of the things that are happening on the actual services and products, and you can look at the impact on the organization. And the, the first is actually easier to measure because you can actually measure, um, and you should measure, the effect of big things you're doing to change the processes. Like if you're starting to do more co-creation, you should be able to track um, certain, certain metrics being um, like swaying one way or the other depending on the actions that you're taking. So that's actually relatively straightforward. But when it comes to actually evaluating and measuring what happens inside your organization, that's a trickier thing. So one of the things um, I'm using as a tool to measure the effect of the changes we're making is through the OKRs, or at least we're planning that at Posti and we did that at Zalando and Google. So actually seeing how the OKRs are changing towards customer and, and human centricity. Um, with every single step you're taking to change the processes to do um, to be more co-creational or more co collaborative. Um, one one uh, sort of um, measurement we used in my earlier life at Google and, and what we're going to use at Posti is having three types of OKRs. You guys know what OKRs are, right? No. <laughs> um, it, it's, it's too. It's, it, I don't have enough time to explain it, but basically you should check it out. Remember to um, read about OKRs. But the point is, um, what we used as a, as a measuring stick was that how many um, objective level goals were given that were strictly about CEX and not about business or uh, technical, technical goals. So we started measuring the number of um, human-centered objectives in the organization. That's actually one practical way you can, you can quantify how you're doing with collaboration and co-creation. I mean, you have soft ways as well, but that's actually an interesting quantified way if you want to try that out. So Haley, you do work remotely. So when you're having these discussions, do you actually come back to the CX? Do you have any specific things you always come back to? Mm. Well, I mean, I just started with my remote ventures, so I don't know if I um, have a specific um, answer to that component, but I know that one thing that I'm working on with my team right now is um, from a kind of always that, that uh, customer experience and that end user experience perspective is just building in this idea of writing um, user-driven user stories or user-driven outcomes. Uh, when I was at IBM, we had a framework for that and there was um, new language created. We used this word called hills and without getting too much into too much detail, I thought that there was something very innovative about coming up with a new concept because it wasn't loaded, um, like there was nothing that any one discipline or domain owned about that particular world word, um, but, but it kind of focuses on, a hill is just essentially the who, the what, and the wow. So like, who are you serving? What are you doing for them? And what is not just like the way you would measure it, but something that is a unique differentiator um, from, you know, not just competitors, but like that moves the conversation forward for for that user and so I feel like even just framing all the work we do around something like that um, really gets specific um, and really helps people understand what we're trying to do for customers and users. So especially collaboration across different disciplines to find something external that everybody can work towards. Mm -hmm. So Camilla and Haley, I think there were a lot of commonalities and touch points in, in each, each of your talks. So what were the things that resonated most of you were like, yay! Yes. Well, I must say I'm so 
in awe of how wonderful design environments are that you are really trying to get the feedback and really being brave that doing it on Twitter, so like you mentioned, and you too, that, that how it, it really, I was amazed that, okay, you really took the feedback and started over. So I have been in so many big projects that I rarely see that, that, okay, there is some information and everybody in the team knows that, okay, this was a showstopper, we should put the brakes on. But often in practical life, People are so consumed with their bonuses and you know deadlines and everything, so they rather just skip the feedback and just continue, even though they know that okay, we we have a problem here. So really, that example was was really something that stuck with me. So it's really this case when you're mom, the wedding dress is bought, the invitations are sent, but I'm still feeling hesitant about it. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I think also what resonated for me in particular with your talk is uh, the only way that we were even remotely capable of, you know, pausing, putting on the brakes, starting over, was uh, enabling and empowering teams to reflect. Yes. Um, and not just, you know, the whole team um, uh, or reflecting on the people they serve, but also like you're talking about this introspection and this idea of, okay, you know, let's, let's go within <laughs> ourselves yes. and see, you know, a lot of times, I, 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 especially when you were talking about the nuances of, you know, what I perceive versus how somebody is really feeling, uh, moving into a role where I've switched from being an individual contributor to a manager, I'm even now more sensitive to, you know, having to make sh check my own biases and assumptions that I'm not making the wrong assumptions. So exactly. I think that was super healthy. So how do you walk people through failures? Because it, they will happen. Well, I have steps for that, but that is a one lecture. <laughs> um, but it's, it's, it's so important. I think that it's one of the most important things that every organization should, should really look at because there cannot be any innovations or growth if you cannot face disappointments or failures. It's like they come with that territory. So, so really, actually, disappointment is one of the most intriguing emotions there are. And it's, it's a perfect example of emotion that if we fake it and say, okay, it doesn't bother me, just another one, it doesn't matter that I, we lost half a million dollars or whatever, next one, and, and fake it, but instead if we could really listen to, it, to disappointment and sadness, it's, it's, it's one of the emotions that really take energy, so they are, they are actually trying to make us sit down and put the, like, our hands like this and really admit what we are feeling, saying out loud, okay, what went wrong? And that would be really beneficial because it's, in a way, it's, it's forcing you to stop and reflect that, okay, what did we do? And, and really giving you opportunity to, to learn from what you have just experienced instead of just making the same mistake again. So it's really, I see a lot that people don't want to show this. Again, metrics, you know, impressions, everything, especially in the, in the hardcore business life, is preventing this. But, but also, I see a lot of growth in this direction, that, that we all understand that we are humans and everybody's afraid and everybody's doing new things and nobody's sure, but still we can be together and, and you know, go through this. Can I add something real quick? Because, yes. Um, I've actually had a practice uh, in a couple of my teams where we literally celebrated failures. Yes. So the bigger the failure, the bigger the party. So, <laughs> yes. so the, the thing is, I, I feel like what you just said, um, I feel like what I wanted to add is failure is a much more powerful way of learning than succeeding. Because when you're succeeding, you're just doing things and they happen to succeed either by design or by accident. And you don't necessarily think about what it was that you actually learned. It's really easy to forget to do the loop back to exactly. your learnings when you're only succeeding. So, so I'm, I'm actually happy when, when somebody uh, goes through a horrible train wreck because that's, that's a great way for us to um, celebrate the moment of, of uh, misery and then write down what we learned and then just keep moving. 
and you find out one thing that doesn't work and everybody can learn from it. So, sure. so I remember an example from, for example, airline business that they have <laughs> in the previous decades, they have been really, you know, the business of airlines was, was risky business. There was you no know, planes coming down, but they decided long, uh, long ago to share all the mistakes or all the problems that the, the whole field found. And nowadays, the, it's one of the safest ways to travel. So, so really, that, that you can... I always say to myself what Ray Dalio says in his book, Principles, that every time I made a wrong invest, investment or wrong something, he thinks it as an opportunity to find a, a pearl that he can put in his list of principles, that, okay, I won't do this again. So I think of everything like this kind of, yes, I found something, yes, yeah, this will make you, but make me better. So, Haley, you shared the story of how you missed this entire continent called accessibility and then had to catch up. So, and that you didn't just get to talk through the failure within your own team, but a top manager calls in and says, you can't go live with this. So how did you walk your team through that? Yeah, well, I think one thing that, um, in terms of experiencing personal failures, because I do think we don't, I mean, they're not just professional, we take them home, we kind of ruminate over them sometimes um, in potentially unhealthy ways. And I think it was really important for the team in that particular moment, um, especially considering that the consequences were not just like that we weren't launching the site, but that there were also, you know, these people that were missing out on the experience we designed for, was to really have a meaningful discussion about what it was that we as individuals and we as a team um, had control over during that time period and things that we didn't have control over. And, uh, I, and by that I mean to say, I think it's just really important. A lot of times we tend to kind of focus very very much on on the just all the things that that went wrong but like focus like narrowing in on okay what are things that you know i personally <coughs> did that you know now i can i can do differently um, and like activate that change um, required a bit of coaching and started mm -hmm. with that kind of question about what what can I, you know, what have I learned from my personal experience and what can I change? And then what, what were things that were out of our control, right? Because, I mean, some things happen that we know other people, they are involved in those decisions. And, you know, those are things that then you can let go of so mm -hmm. that you can focus on the things that you can solve for. And you mentioned coaching. Um, I think all of you are involved in hiring decisions. So I'm going to use this a bit of a bridge to go to. How do you look for that designer, designer as a mindset when you're hiring people and you're currently hiring a lot of service designers? Um, I think the first thing I'm looking for is curiosity, like actually just making sure that people are naturally curious and are interested in, in a wide variety of things. Um, I'm also looking for growth attitude. So I think I already mentioned in my um, own keynote that um, I feel like one of the greatest traits for a designer is to have the willingness to learn and to teach. And, um, I want to hear that when I'm interviewing people. So I want to have them proactively say that I want to learn something and I want to teach something. I'm going to ask if you're not, you're not saying that, but it's, it's even better if you can actually tell me proactively that, that these, are the things, um, these are the things that I'm good at and these are the things I want to teach and these are the things I want to learn from others. So um, when you get those two things, the attitude and the natural curiosity in place, everything else is just technical know-how, and that can be built. So tools can be taught to anyone, processes can be agreed on, but the attitude and, and the natural inclination to curiosity can't really be taught to anyone. And Camila, when it comes to hiring decisions, there are a lot of tools out there that try to, not just from the interpersonal talk to talk, figure out what that person is like, but also measure it, draw a picture of them. So is there something related to emotional intelligence out there that people can use or under certain, no circumstances should use for hiring decisions? I was actually just interviewed for recruiting and I was like, how did you find me? I'm not a specialist in recruiting, but um, there are common things that, that, that often people would talk about, this gut feeling that I have this instinct that, okay, this person is right for us. And, and often, like we have talked, we have biases sometimes that, that we might be, you know, like people who are like us, and it's not 
necessarily a good thing to hire people who are like you, but, mm. but to, to really find people who are different. So my point of view is in that is to listen to that intuition and, and also listen to other things than just facts, but listen to that emotion channel, if you will, or intuition or your experience or gut feeling, because many people say that who have recruited a lot, that that is really that if you have the hunch in the beginning that there's not something is not matching, this person doesn't sit in our culture or mindset or something. Those people, I'm not an expert, but those people say that often that is right. <coughs> Yeah, I guess one thing that I think about um, when, when, when we're talking about this topic um, just is the importance of, and I probably mentioned this also in the talk a little bit, but um, finding you know, uh, designers who uh, really understand that design is applied in so many other places. So it's, it's not um, just their understanding of design, but it's their curiosity for potentially mundane um, like topics or areas of interest or hobbies or things that they're passionate about outside of design. Um, you know, a lot of um, you know designers, for example, and when when I was working at IBM, they have to go into these really complex spaces working on like mainframe servers, right? Or like working with system admins um, or like just things that maybe for them, like that idea of ever doing that job or understanding what those people do seems completely out of their comfort zone. And I actually think that kind of helping, looking for designers who have a much broader interest in design and seeing projects even in their portfolio that show a range of kind of mm, demonstrated interests in, and maybe they're fascinated by political science or they, their undergrad was actually in biology and they've now switched into design. I think kind of trying to find those interdisciplinary um, folks are, are the folks who will help us design the future. So that now we're really properly training designers, we might be losing something of that when people used to come from all different backgrounds and drop into design. And exactly, that, that is... <coughs> Something that I also talk a lot, that, that if we look at the science of innovation, they say actually that the innovations comes from, from different areas. So, so somebody who is really into design and design thinking and is all educated in that, actually person who has no idea about what are the rules, what are the principles, they can come and say, that, okay, why do you have that in there? I, we had the startup emotion tracker and I remember one time that there was a person coming in and we had worked a lot. And he was coming in like, why do you have that button? And I, oh, yeah, of, of, of. I was like, no, actually, good question. So also that, that actually that if people have hobbies which doesn't have any relation to, to the problems that you have at work. But actually, when they look at that, where does the innovation come from, they, they can come from your you know, fishing hobby, that there is some system that works there, and then you have a uh, space in your head to understand that actually, if I take this system to my problem, that it might be a solution. And that is the way to, to find the, the real innovations. And I love how, the, for example, I was in a this kind of Singularity University boot camp. And they, 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 there was this uh, NASA specialist who told that actually they, for example, look at hummingbirds for when they're designing uh, these um, aircrafts or helicopters, because hummingbirds can, can stop and go backwards. And I thought it was amazing. <laughs> Do you find in nature something mm. that you can mimic? A biomimicry, yes. yes. That's, that's actually something that's been, I, I, I love that. Yeah. Um, it's actually something that has been changing over the, over the years, or that's one of the things I've noticed as, as a design leader um, recently, that uh, when, we've be, when we've started to like really educate designers as designers, uh, there's this really annoying construct that's been kind of surfacing, at least in the Finnish design scene, where people are starting to make statements like, well, that's not service design, or that's not UX design. And I don't really give a shit of the rules of what, what design is, because the rules are imaginary constructs, right? We, we know that better than anyone when we're starting to create design systems. We are creating, um, we're creating like these absolute truths or guidelines or however deep you want to bring it, which are completely imaginary. They, they serve a purpose when it's a design system. 
But when somebody tells you that that's not service design, because I was taught that service design is X, Y, or Z, that's a destructive construct, and then you, you really, really shouldn't keep that going. Like, I, feel, I feel like there's value, like there's a lot of value with high education in design, but I also think that there's, there's high value in people like me who quit high school because they were born in school and wanted to do design. So um, I kind of think it's, it's awesome to see a lot of people coming from different backgrounds, and we as designers in general shouldn't go too deep into making statements of what design is and what design isn't, because it's going to be different for everyone. Yeah, I, I just want to build on that really quickly and just say that I also run into the opposite, um, which is that I oftentimes work with people from, you know, all different fields or, or backgrounds or whatever, and they always say to me as a caveat, well, I'm not a designer. And, mm. you know what I mean, just so you know, yeah. like, mm. I'm not going to be able to do that thing or whatever. And you just sit there and, and I mean, for me personally, I mean, especially when you're talking about design as a mind mindset and mm. as our intentions behind our outcomes, a big thing that comes to mind is like, anyone can have an intent, right? Sure. Anyone can kind of start from that that process in, in, in that place. And so even though there's a wide range of possible executions um, or implementations of that thing, I, I really, I, I always tell them like, you're, you're, you are a designer, <laughs> at least to me. Yes. Um, so, yeah. It's like your perspective is valuable regardless yes. of. Yes. But the people say often, I'm not creative. I think that everybody's creative. Yeah. Sure, one way or the other. Yeah, right. Actually, that brings me to a great point. Um, I had this really awesome discussion with one of my own mentors um, um, about a year ago. We, we were talking about um, we were talking about what design actually is, um, um, to who and how, what are the different angles, and, and we actually ended up with a thought that when you start thinking about it, design uh, is a mindset that's essentially a problem solving problem solving mechanism right there are others like there are, there there's development which is another kind of a problem solving mechanism and one of the weirdest things that's happening in my mind is that design and development are seen as two different things that are fighting against each other kind of like with design and marketing because these are all actually problem solving mechanisms you're solving problems but you're solving them from slightly different angles with slightly different approaches which is actually, incidentally, also why I think all CX disciplines are going to fuse into one eventually. Time is flying when you're having fun, so at this point I would like to ask if somebody in the audience has a question. If you have, please raise your hand, a mic will come to you. And meanwhile, raise your hand if you have a question. I would like each of you to state one thing that people should be following right now. Following. Following. That's something really exciting, interesting, that you think is going to shape the future. But keeping your eye on. Who mm -hmm. oh, start? Um, good, good question. I, 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 I just think that I always, all the time, try to find new things that, for example, reading Helsingin Sanomat, <laughs> reading a, a classic paper, classic somebody, some, some um, a magazine or something that will give you all of a sudden biology or IT or politics or government or telling about Afghanistan showing in the map. I think that that is, I always get so, Excited that I didn't, and I didn't realize this morning that I will be learning about bees, because I think it's 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 so scary to think of the social media and the things that they might be narrowing my environment and making me a bubble and selecting all these these topics that you have been pushing, and now I only get certain information, and it's really scary. So in a way, for me. <laughs> that I read something that is completely something else. So I dare to break the bubble. Sorry to cut in. Yes. Was it one word? <laughs> I think that there was many. Yes. <laughs> well, my answer was many is I, I, that I want me. Yes. Well, Where's the bubble? Um, I would recommend, if, especially if you uh, have heard of like Joint Futures, the conference that was here recently, um, this past fall, there's a um, speaker. Her name is Dory Tunstall, and she has she's a professor. Her work is called Decolonizing Design, mm -hmm. and uh, it really it speaks a lot to how um, 
you know, our, our, his, our design history is kind of built on a certain singular homogenous perspective and um, she is kind of, re, at least in my opinion right now, rewriting that curriculum. So that's a space I would definitely pay attention to. And during the Q&A, after that talk, somebody asked, you know, how do I find out more about this? How do I learn to be more inclusive? And she went, well, you can go on Google, start investigating things. You know, it's not that hard. You just have to figure out ways to overcome those assumptions that you have. Um, I wouldn't necessarily ask people to follow certain things, because trends come and go. It's just really generally a good idea to follow things and be curious and follow a lot of things at the same time. Um, but what I would actually like people to do is to think about their behaviors as designers. And I think the best thing I feel I can contribute to those behaviors is to always think of um, what's the one rule you are breaking when you're doing these things. So if you're not breaking any rules, you're really not innovating. So you should really think about um, what's your one small way to revolt today? How do you start a revolution? And how do you, how do you break the rules? How do you break the boundaries? Because that's the way we, you grow as a designer and that's the way design grows. Super. Yes. Uh, jumping on, on your comment regarding breaking the rule, I mean the, the, you both work in big companies uh, with big design teams. Thank you. Uh, what is the, the one rule you would like to break in the way uh, designers work together? Uh, today's so the structure or the, the model of collaboration between designers. Do you want to go first? It was a design related. Yes. What, what rule I want to break? Yeah. Yeah, he kind of give you the burden. It was terrible. <laughs> but in teams, I would like to. Um, one of the things that I have been um, raising a lot lately is that if you feel something that I, I, this is my opinion, this is what I think, and even oftentimes people talk about it in the, in the, in the cafe and something, and then there comes a meeting, tea meeting, and somebody raises it, but then nobody else says that, oh, I agree, and then the one person might be left alone there, so I would like to break that. So if you feel that, yes, I agree with that. You you say actually I'm 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 with Yanni. Yes, th this is the one that I I also believe because then we would skip the troublemaker stigma or whatever mm -hmm. rebel <laughs> rebel in a negative sense stigma. If we would like everybody would raise their hands and support each other if we feel that that is the right thing. I think the rule I want to break, and I'm not sure if this is even breaking rules anymore. I think it's just a natural. Um, natural evolution of what design teams are going to be like is that um, for the, in the past, I need to backtrack this a bit so that you'll get the reference. So in the past, um, when we used to be like um, working in an industrial mode where you had workers and you had middle managers and you had managers and you had executives, um, the way blame and failing and, and problems work was that um, the, the people, the lower people and the trenches made mistakes and they were punished for them. And then we turned into a world where it went the opposite, the opposite way. So it became the manager's responsibility to bear the burden of the failure. So this was like five years ago, ten years ago. Um, design leaders, for example, were taught that team um, celebrates successes together, but the team manager always fails alone. And that resulted in some really, really bad psychological problems for a lot of people. So now we're going in a more healthy direction, um, but we're still quite not there um, in, in that the entire team is responsible for both its successes and failures, because you stand stronger together. And that's, that's actually not a new thing, but the rules that we still have as design teams are that you have this role and you have that role, and you, you succeed in this and you succeed in this. So I want to break that mold and really start thinking about how does the entire team empower itself to succeed and fail together. Speaking of failure, I'm currently failing uh, in keeping time. <laughs> so I know there was one brave person with a question, but I'm going to ask you to come here a bit later. And I would like to move now to the closing words and thanking you for your presence here today. Um, so we've heard a lot about behavior and cultural building. And 
I'm going to give a bit of anecdote. So the dress I have on, this fabric, is 34, it was designed 35 years ago. So when you go out to your work today, you might think, what are the decisions I make that will last the next 2, 20, 35 years? And can you live with that? So with that, thank you. Um, let's give one more applause for everybody.